me immense pleasure to introduce our speaker, Matthew E. Taylor, who got his PhD in computer science uh, in from UT Austin. And after multiple positions in academia and industry, he is now a tenured associate professor at the University of Alberta. He directs the Intelligent Robot Learning Lab, IRL, and is a fellow in residence at Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. His current research interests include not only fundamental improvements to reinforcement learning uh, algorithm and then the paradigm, but also applying these to real world problems and human AI interaction. Professor Taylor will be uh, talking on how reinforcement learning agents can learn from existing knowledge and was better, faster, and how they can collaborate with humans to achieve targets that would not be possible if humans and agents they tried on their own. Professor Taylor, once again, a very warm welcome, and uh, you may take the floor now. Thank you so much, and please uh, yell at me if you can't hear me or can't see my slides. Um, I particularly, particularly like the warm welcome. It is negative 25C here right now. <laughs> So it's wonderful <laughs> visiting you. Um, it, I was really excited to talk to you today about some of the things we've been working on because right now reinforcement learning is a great tool that can be used for lots of interesting things, but there's also really interesting fundamental research that's going on. So I'm gonna try to balance this, talk about some of the cool things that reinforcement learning could do, but also where I think it needs to go, particularly how agents need to work better with humans and how humans and agents can team together. So with that, we'll start off with a little reinforcement learning background to make sure that just to kind of level set to make sure everyone's familiar with some of the terms. And then I'll talk about a couple of ways that we could improve reinforcement learning by learning from demonstrations or action advice. Then I'll talk about how human agent teaming is a critical uh, research topic. And then I'll end with some open challenges. In reinforcement learning, unlike supervised learning, there's no right or wrong answers. So in supervised learning, you can say, I think this stock is gonna go up by $2 in the next day. And then you find out, no, actually the stock went up by $2, two and a half dollars. So you get the ground truth. In reinforcement learning, you don't have that. Instead, you have an agent that's just interacting with an environment. And this environment could be a simulator, it could be the real world, but the agent gathers data and over time, it tries to learn. So what is the agent trying to do? The agent is in a state, so it's in some setting, and then it tries to take an action. And then the environment tells it what is the next state, what's the next place it ends up after taking that action, and what is the reward? and the reward is what the agent is trying to maximize. And you never know, well, I just did something, I got a reward, was that the best I could have done? You never know. So that's why there's a constant balance where you have to trade off exploring and exploiting. Do I want to try something new or do I want to do what I think is pretty good and really get reward from that? So let, let me give you an example. This is Flappy Bird. So this is one of the simplest reinforcement learning domains you could think of. You might have um, seen this game on your phone a few years ago, but here you have a bird that is trying to get past these pipes. And right now you see zero. This bird has gotten past zero pipes and this poor bird is not doing very well because this is the beginning of learning. At the beginning of reinforcement learning, the agent is just acting randomly. Now, if we fast forward to say after, oh, let's say an hour and 15 minutes of training, now the bird is doing better. If we fast forward towards, oh, let's say two and a half hours, now the bird is achieving superhuman uh, performance. Now, how does the bird do this? Well, there's a transition function. So this is when, this, when you're in a state and you take an action, what is the next state? That's controlled by this simulator. The action in this case is just flap your wings. So if you're playing this on your phone, if you tap the screen, you flap your wings. That's the only thing you can do, flap or don't flap. The reward is the number of pipes that you've passed. And then you could say, well, what's a good state representation? 
Well, if you're a, a deep learning person, you might say, well, I'm going to use a convolutional neural network and look at all the pixels in this image. Or if you're a little bit more clever, you could say, actually, my agent just needs two numbers. The agent needs to know the distance from me to the end of the next pipe and the distance from me to the bottom of the next pipe. And with just those two numbers, just those uh, two values representing my state in the world, this agent can learn to act optimally. So this is an example where you as a, as a machine learning person could go in and define the state re representation, and then our agent could learn superhuman behavior. So in general, just to recap, in reinforcement learning, the agent's trying to maximize some reward. In this case, it was the number of pipes that you've passed. And you want to do that with relatively little data. So you could think of if I want to analyze the performance of a reinforcement learning agent, I could look at its performance on the y-axis and the amount of time or the amount of data I needed on the x-axis. And in this case, we'd want to pass as many pipes as possible and we'd want to learn as fast as possible. Now, like we heard in the last talk, low code and no code is, is getting very popular in the last panel. And reinforcement learning is one way where machine learning uh, specialists are trying to reduce human effort. So you as a programmer could have absolutely fiddled around with if then else uh, while loops to get that bird to fly, or with a few lines of reinforcement learning code, you can get the agent to learn that itself. And you can not only potentially achieve superhuman performance, but you can come up with novel solutions. And that's one of the exciting things when your agent can do something that you hadn't thought of. The final benefit I'll mention of reinforcement learning is you can handle non-stationary environments. So if your agent continues to learn, if something changes, the agent should be able to adapt to that. So for instance, if you have a Mars rover and one of the wheels starts locking up, reinforcement learning might be able to learn to account for that and still keep you going straight even when one of your actuators slows down. So this was a very simple example of reinforcement learning. And usually when you talk about machine learning, you think about supervised learning, in some cases unsupervised learning. And not everyone realizes that reinforcement learning is actually useful today. When I started uh, working on reinforcement learning, uh, what, 19 years ago, it was just kind of a fun thing that we could do, use for video games. And that's still where some of reinforcement learning's great successes are. So in AlphaGo, for instance, where um, reinforcement learning beat Lee Stoll, or there's uh, examples in Dota or StarCraft with superhuman performance. But actually, reinforcement learning is also useful for data center cooling useful in lots of cases of robotics. There's an interesting project that's happening um, at the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute where I work on using reinforcement learning for water treatment. So actually making water more, uh, you, uh, reducing the, num the amount of chemicals you use to purify water. So it's an environmental and cost savings. And I was also lucky enough a few years ago to work on a stock trading agent. So act, we actually have a, we, uh, the Royal Bank of Canada has a deployed reinforcement learning agent that's actually trading stocks. So reinforcement learning is a technology that is used, that can be used today. And if this is interesting, I really encourage you to learn more about it. Now at this point, I could stop and go through how amazing reinforcement learning is and the many ways it's done impressive things. But instead, instead of my industry hat, I'm gonna put my researcher hat on and expose a few of the weaknesses, which is good because that, that as a researcher, that keeps me in business. We, haven't, we have not solved everything. So one of the examples that's often uh, talked about is OpenAI's uh, defense, of the, defense of the Ancients. So this was a multi-agent game where they were able to de defeat a, a Tip top human team. But what is not, not often emphasized is OpenAI use hundreds of years of compute. So when you have large data centers, you can use hundreds of years of CPU or GPU or possibly TPU time. And there's obviously a large environmental cost to this, but also a real large 
energy cost and there's a real time cost. So if you're not a billion dollar company or don't have backing by a billion dollar company, reinforcement learning might be a little bit slow in some cases. So we often assume that the MDP is provided. So this is our Markov decision process. The agent and the environment um, act, have actions and the state and reward. And typically as a reinforcement learning uh, specialist, you assume that MDP, that formulation is handed to you. In practice, you have to define it. So you need a subject matter expert. In this case, you would need a gaming experts to help you define that state. If you're looking at stock trading, you want stock traders to help you define that state. And often we gloss over how human knowledge gets put into the problem definition. So that's one place where humans are critical for reinforcement learning is actually defining the problem. Because if you define the wrong problem, you can learn for hundreds of years and not accomplish the right task. One of the other weaknesses of reinforcement learning is learning from scratch. So in the video of Flappy Bird, that bird was horrible at the beginning. Now, if, if you want to, say, trade stocks, you really don't want to lose all of your money right at the beginning where your agent is learning. You would really like that agent to have some reasonable performance from the start. And if we want to go from learning in hundreds of years to hours, you really want to leverage that background knowledge that exists in the world. And that's what I'm going to talk about a lot today, is how can we have our agents start off not from scratch, but learning from something better. So my research over the, the past 10, 10 or so years has really been looking at, instead of thinking about a single agent in the environment, what if there are existing agents? So there could be a human that could help an agent learn. There could be an existing agent that could help another agent learn. And potentially, we could also have a reinforcement learning agent help a human learn. So instead of thinking about just an RL agent, we've been thinking about, I have a student, and that student is interacting with the environment, and that student for this talk is going to be a reinforcement learning agent, and I have a teacher. And that teacher could do a bunch of things. That teacher could give extra rewards. That teacher could help uh, formulate state. The teacher could say what action the student could take. All of this is possible. And we're going to assume that there's a single teacher that's always there to help. The teacher wants to help. So unlike a cybersecurity setting, we don't need to worry about an adversarial teacher. But we will assume that the teacher could be suboptimal. So, I, so the, the setting for the next few sections of the talk is I have a reinforcement learning agent that's going to learn, and there's a teacher that's going to be able to assist it, that's going to help that agent learn faster. So there's a, many ways that this teacher could help a student. One of the ways that I'll talk about first is demonstrations. So if you think about our, our flappy bird, you could think, well, instead of learning from scratch, what if we had a person play that game? What if we had a person sit down and hit the space bar to make, make the bird flap? In order to do that, or, or in order to leverage that, one method is human agent transfer. Hat. Oh, so note, note to the students in the audience, when you come up with new algorithms, I highly recommend trying to come up with a fancy name because it's so much easier to talk about the hat algorithm than the algorithm that Taylor et al introduced. So this hat algorithm relies on the human demonstrating something. So the human sitting down at the keyboard and playing the game. And we take those state action pairs. So in, in the, the flappy bird was in a state and the person took an action, they did or did not flap. And then we say these, this set of state action pairs is data. So we can take this data and use some supervised learning method to come up with, in this case, a decision list. So this decision list is trying to summarize the data and it is summarizing the human's policy. So given, given this uh, green box number two, we can say, well, 
if the agent is in a particular state, I can use this summarization to say, I think the human will take this action. So I mentioned before, reinforcement learning, you can explore or exploit. So with one of the ways to do this is something called epsilon greedy. So most of the time you can exploit your knowledge. Sometimes you can explore. Now, because we've got this summarization of the human's policy, now we have an extra option. So instead with some probability, we can say, I'm going to execute the action that I think the human would take. And we can turn this, the probability of forcing the agent to take this action, we can turn the probability of that down over time. So initially, remember the agent is really bad at the beginning. Initially, the agent can try to mimic the human. And then over time, you can rely on the human less and less and rely on your own knowledge. So instead of Flappy Bird, let me give you a, a different example. This is the game of keep away. You might've played this on the field as a child. In this case, we have three take keepers in red that are trying to maintain possession of the ball. We have two takers in blue that are trying to get the ball or kick it out of bounds. And you'll notice that right there was a missed pass. You'll notice that these agents are not perfect. And that's because there is sensor and actuator noise. So every time one of these players tries to kick the ball, there's a chance it's gonna kick it out of bounds or the other um, keeper will miss the pass. So in this case, you could have a human that would sit here and you can see this with this animation, it's not super fast, but it's also not trivial. And we had people sit down and play this game where the human would take the role of whichever keeper had the ball, and then they could either maintain possession or decide to pass to one of the two teammates. So a person would sit down at the keyboard, control the keeper with the ball, and then we would record what the person was doing, say in every state, what action did they take? And that action could be just maintain possession. Then we summarize that human's policy and we use that human's policy to help us learn faster. So there's a number of ways you could evaluate the speed up method. And one way is to look at the jump start. So what's the initial performance? In this case, at time zero, there's not really a difference. So in this case, in this method, this hat speed up method, we don't really get much of a benefit there. We could look at the performance after 30 hours of training. We see that our line in orange is a little bit above the line in red. And you could look at the total reward, the area under the curve. So this is great for, for an academic paper, you can say, our line, our algorithms line is slightly above the, the baseline. So for an academic paper, this is great. You can just say our method is better. But from a practical perspective, you could also say, well, let's suppose I really didn't want to deploy my agent until I reached a performance of 14. For some reason, that, that was the minimum level that I was willing to let my agent out in the world. Then you could say, well, if I'm learning from scratch, that red line takes around 14 hours to learn and using HAT, it takes around eight hours. So I can learn in roughly half the time to achieve this performance and I can get this performance improvement with only three minutes of human time. So this is the key point that Remember, Flappy Bird had to learn for hours before it was doing reasonably well. And with human demonstration, with just a small amount of human demonstration, you can get very large improvements. So this hat method is now 10 years old and it is not state of the art, but I like it because it's fairly simple. You can see that, well, I'm just taking the human, I'm trying to guess what the human would do, and then I can use that guess to bias my, my exploration, bias how I'm going to act. So this is one way where you could have a human sit down, provide a bunch of demonstrations, a few minutes, and then leverage that um, with the agent so that it can learn faster. That's one approach. Now, another well-known approach is the dagger algorithm. So in this case, 
the, the goal of dagger is for a human to provide a demonstration and then let the agent try to execute that demonstration. And this is, and, and things will, will go wrong. So if you think about, if you watch uh, an expert driver and try to imitate them, at some point you're gonna make a minor mistake. Now that expert driver probably never made that minor mistake. So you never see the correction. So if you're driving, if you go slightly off center, then you know how to correct and come back into the center of the lane. But if the driver never made that mistake, your demonstration doesn't contain any examples of correcting and coming back to the center. So you're off course a little bit, and now all of a sudden you're hitting the wall. So what Dagger does is it's an iterative algorithm and says every time something goes wrong, you can go and get more data. So this is an iterative way of collecting more and more demonstrations from a person. And under some reasonable assumptions, they can show that it will, it will converge to a good policy. So I'm not gonna go into the details of this algorithm, algorithm, but this is a different setting that I wanted to bring up. In HAT, you give a demonstration and the person walks away. In Dagger, you can continually ask for more demonstrations and say, okay, I think something went wrong here. Can you please give me some more, another demonstration where I need more information? So this is a way of figuring out where to ask for demonstrations. And it's the, the assumption is that you say, person, I'm gonna teleport you to a state and now I want you to play the game or, or do this thing for me. But you could also think about asking for individual actions. So in this section, we've been talking about a person sitting down and playing a game or doing something and you watch them. But you could also think about more targeted advice. So thinking about giving individual actions from a teacher. So this is the second modality that I'm going to talk about, where we think about how can we get, uh, instead of a full demonstration, what if it's kind of expensive to get that help? What if we can't ask the person to give us loads and loads of playthroughs of the game, but a person could just give us a little bit of advice? Or maybe I have a robot that I've bought and I bring it home and I'd like my old robot to teach my new robot. Now I could do something like transfer learning, but if I don't have access to that old, old robot's brain, it still might be able to give some suggestions to my new robot. So here, let me transition to the game of Pac-Man, which hopefully many of you have played. So in this case, we have a student agent that can interact with the environment. And we're gonna assume that we have some teacher. So we have a teacher agent that's more experienced. And we're gonna assume that I can't get at the teacher's brain. I can't just take the neural network from the old teacher and stick it into the new teacher. But instead I can get this action advice. So this lets, uh, frees us up to work with um, fewer requirements, uh, but also lets us think about a teacher being a person. So we're gonna assume that this teacher can help us, but the teacher is not infinitely patient. Instead, that teacher only has a limited budget and we wanna figure out when is the best time for the teacher to help the student? When should the teacher say, hey student, go right. Hey, Pac-Man, go left. So in Pac-Man, we're looking at a setting where there's up to 2,000 steps, so 2,000 actions in an episode, and you can train for 500 episodes. But what's interesting is we're saying the teacher can only give 1,000 pieces of advice. So if the teacher just gave all its advice at the beginning, the teacher would essentially give a demonstration for half of the first episode and then be done. But it seems like we should be able to do something better. There should be places where we could, we would not need the teacher's advice, and we might be able to save that. So where can, how can we better figure out where the teacher should give that advice? When should the teacher give advice? And importantly, remember we're in the setting where we're assuming the teacher is not optimal. So we want to make sure that our student can outperform the teacher. So what's the simplest thing you could do? Well, 
early advising. I am going to tell the teacher to use up its entire budget right away. Just give as much advice to the student as you can. Okay, that, that's an that's a okay baseline. The next thing you might think of is, well, I only want to give advice when the state is important. So if a state is not important, I'll just let the agent learn. But if something bad is going to happen, maybe I can help the student get out of that difficult situation and they could learn a lot from that. And of course, the crux is what is an important state. One way you could define the state is the difference in the best and worst values according to the teacher. So the teacher could look at the student and in this left, on the left, the student, uh, excuse me, the teacher could say, student, you're about to die. If you take the wrong action, this is really bad. So student, I'm going to jump in and tell you, you need to go up. I'm going to use up my budget to save you. Whereas on the right side, eh, you could go up, you could go right, doesn't really matter. Maybe the teacher should reserve its budget for when it's more important, more impactful. So this is the heuristic. There are absolutely learning methods that could come up and learn when to do this, but let's just think of this simple heuristic. Now we've been we've been talking about one-way communication. We have a uh, as as in many undergraduate classrooms, you have a teacher that is yelling at a student, and the student just listens. You could also think of a situation where there's two-way communication, where a student could say, "Teacher, I I'm going to go up. Is that okay?" And then the teacher could say, well, you're going to go up and that's, that's a reasonable thing. So I'm not going to use up some advice. Or the teacher might say, oh no, don't go up. You're going to die. This is an important state. I'm going to interrupt you and say, don't go up, go right. So this is a way of the teachers saving its advice for only when the student's going to mess up. But this is not very satisfying. If you are playing Pac-Man, it goes so quickly. You cannot ask on every action, should I go right? Should I go right? Should I go right? This is not very realistic. So instead of having this asking before each action, you could also have the teacher model the student. So you could have the teacher say, I think the student is going to go up and either that's the right action or this is not an important state, so I won't say anything. Or the teacher might say, I think the student's going to go right. I know that's really bad. I'm going to use up some of my budget and interrupt the student and say, don't go right, go up instead. So these are four different heuristic methods that we could use to try to let the teacher figure out when to teach. So here's an example of, of learning from scratch. First, we have learning from no advice. You see, we get a bunch of bad rewards at the very beginning. And then over time, we learn. If I used early advising, if I use up all of my budget at the very beginning, my performance at the beginning still isn't that great. But that infusion of advice on the very first episode helps me learn much faster. So this was the early advice, use up all the advice at the very beginning. And then the improvement on that, importance advising is in this kind of yellow curve. So we see we do a little bit better. If we do the mistake correcting, we get a very nice curve where we learn very quickly. And it turns out if we do in, uh, the predictive advising, we do just as well. So we can actually replace that two-way communication with just the teacher modeling what the student would do. So this shows us that indeed, if we are more judicious about where the teacher applies that advice, we can use that budget more effectively. Now there's a few, few interesting things I'm gonna point out here. One is that the teacher in this case, I believe had a performance around 1000. So the teacher wasn't that great and the student was able to learn to outperform the teacher. The other thing you might notice is there's an interesting U shape here. So we see that when we use this demonstration, the, uh, the student agent learns quickly and then the performance goes down a little bit and then before it goes up. And this is actually a common thing we see in both transfer learning, but also in this action advising. 
And it ha we don't have a great understanding of why this happens, but the current understanding is that the teacher helps the agent learn, but then as that student agent um, starts exploring more, then it starts going off the garden path and starts uh, exploring, not doing quite as well before it recovers that really high performance. <laughs> Um, welcome huh? to Zoom. Um, so it, here we can see that indeed, by using advice from a, a teacher, we can improve our performance. Now, in this case, this was all teacher initiated. The teacher was looking at the student and thinking, should I interrupt? There's also lots of interesting work on the students initiating this. So the student could say, hey, teacher, I'm confused. Can you help me out here? So there's a bunch of ongoing research on looking at how to better use this more senior teacher. Um, I'll talk about that at the very end in open challenges. But this was an example of where you could have this teacher. The teacher could be an agent. It could be a person to give targeted advice, a small amount of advice to a student agent in order to get fairly large improvements. And the argument here is, well, one of the arguments for why I think this is interesting is that teacher could also be an existed, existing hand-coded program. So for instance, if I coded up a program to play Flappy Bird, or if I, co if I had a, a bunch of quants who did a lot of research in order to make a good stock trading program, yeah. that stock trading program could just give advice to my learning agent. So if I have an existing controller, an existing program, if that, if that exists, I could use that to help my reinforcement learning agent learn faster. And if it's there, why not use it? Why do we want our agents to learn from scratch? Why not use that existing knowledge and help our agents learn faster and learn better? And that's, that's one of my, my arguments that I, I really want to make today, that if you're doing reinforcement learning, if there's some existing knowledge, think about whether you can exploit that, because it might save you a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of energy and compute. But so far, I've just talked about a teacher helping a student. And I said, well, that, that teacher could be a human. But that's still saying a human can, can work with an RL agent and then the human will walk away. And now our RL agent can go do its thing on its own. And that's great. In a lot of places, that's, that's a perfectly reasonable solution. So we can think about just completely autonomous agents. And this is where you start thinking about robotics in particular. So you can think about things that are dirty, dangerous, or dull. So this is a picture from the, the US uh, about 110 years ago, it was the 11, 11 year old coal miner. So we really don't want people mining coal. It, you get black lung disease, it's bad for your health. You really want robots doing this kind of job. And we want robots to just do this autonomously, just dig the coal, bring it out for us. We can also have these robots do completely new things. So for instance, package delivery or automating factories, you know, if I have a very well-controlled, well-structured environment, we've had industrial robots since the 1960s. So if the environment is very well-controlled, just let an autonomous robot do it. Great. Unfortunately, there are also many cases where fully autonomous agents probably are not the right solution. So one example I'd like to highlight is something, uh, an experiment called the moral machine. So at MIT did this experiment on the moral machine where they asked a bunch of people over the internet to make decisions. So you've probably heard of the trolley problem. So in the trolley problem, in this case, you say there's a trolley that is gonna go down, go down the line and will kill these five people if you do nothing, or you can pull the lever, the trolley will change path and kill one person. And there's lots of ethical implications of, well, you are taking an action, so you are taking that one life, or you could do nothing. And in the moral machine, 
they changed this to the autonomous car machine. Uh, you've got an autonomous car that's coming up to a crosswalk, all right, and suddenly uh, a one uh, an older man walks in front of you. You can either tell the car to hit the older man or first the car to swerve and hit a dog. Or the, there's an older man in front of you and you could swerve and hit four children. So all, none of these have good outcomes. All of these are awful. But they're cases where you need to think about how would I make this moral decision? And it turns out there are differences culturally. There are differences in age. Depending on where you are in the world, depending on who you are, you will likely make different decisions about whose life is more important. And I, I hope to God I never have to make this decision. But you can see that if you have machines in the real world, sometimes there will be important decisions that those machines might have to make. And we really want a human in the loop. We don't want machines, at least at this point, to try to make those decisions for us. Now, another example of where we really th can think about um, humans helping out, this is interesting. There we go. Um, and another thing we can think about is if we have a human and an agent working together, then maybe we can get just a better solution than we could have if the agent was working on its own. And we wanna think about places where, yeah, we could, we could probably have an agent do that, but I bet a human agent team would produce a better result. So let me give you a few examples of that. This first example is from Microsoft Research. It's not really a reinforcement learning example, but it's a good example of human AI teaming. So in this calendar help application, the goal was someone is sending you requests from meetings and it would be great if an agent could just process those requests and schedule them for you. Well, if you have an agent that is trying to do this for you, it's going to come up with situations where it gets confused. The agent doesn't know what to do, so yeah. it could escalate. So the human could say, or excuse me, the agent could say, hey, I need some help from a human. And you could also think, well, those that first layer of human might not be skilled labor. We could also say, well, those humans that aren't very well trained, they, in some cases, they could be confused. Let me ask an expert human. So I could have multiple tiers. Now, the thing that was really exciting about this work is you could say, well, if I escalate all the way to my expert worker, then if I did that escalation, I should use that to be able to help train the second tier. Or if my agent was confused and it escalated to tier two, then whatever tier two does should help that agent improve. And this is really one of the cool things about human agent teaming is thinking about how the agents can learn from humans and also vice versa. Because if you have an agent partner, the better you can understand them, the better you can anticipate them, the better off the whole system will be. So the way this works in practice is you get, get a request and if it's not a meeting, then hopefully the, uh, the agent can figure that out and say, well, I'm only handling meetings. If it's not a meeting, I'm gonna ignore it. Then if it is a meeting, do I have enough information to schedule it? If not, escalate. And then can I, if I need to find multiple time or times for multiple people, so I need to get um, a number of pe five people in a meeting, I can go and ask those four other people for their time preferences. If they don't respond or they don't respond in the right way, then I could escalate. But this is a really interesting example of a human agent team that can help with a very simple task of scheduling a calendar meeting. But it's one example where as, as many of the simple requests, we want our agent to handle that. We don't want to involve humans, but there's going to be some requests that the agent just cannot handle because our agents do not have the same background as humans. They do not have the same ability as humans, but the human agent team is able to handle it. A more serious example is from a startup in Montreal, AIR, AI Redefined, and AIR is really interested in human agent teaming. 
they looked at emergency vehicle dispatch. So typically you've got a room with a bunch of operators and in the US or in, or in Canada, when a, a 911 call comes in and the human needs to decide what to do. Do I uh, send an ambulance? Do I send multiple police? Do I send fire? And the problem is there's a there's a set number of people that are sitting in that in that center. Too. And with some probability, there's going to be a bunch of um, calls coming in and the humans get overwhelmed. So you could think about let's have the humans handle the most important calls and the calls that are either not that important or easy, we could let the agents handle and dispatch whatever needs to be done. Now, another problem that, that comes in is if someone calls 911 and asks to order a pizza, that's almost certainly not a misdial. That person probably meant to call 911 and they are asking for a pizza because someone is listening and they're in, for instance, a domestic situation where they can't, they, there are other people that could hear and they can't say that they need help. If an agent hears someone ordering a pizza, they may not understand the significance of that. And sure, you could hand code that one exception, but there are lots of these one-off or very weird exceptions that come in that a human with their background knowledge could handle, whereas an agent could get very confused. So if someone calls ordering a pizza, the agent does not understand it and can easily escalate to a human. But for the simple calls, when the, when the humans are overwhelmed, the agents can just help out and take care of that for them. You can also think of robotics, teaming. So in this case, the human is trying to build this circuit and the robot is watching the human build this circuit. This is work by Bradley Hayes. And the robot figures out what the human needs to complete this task. And the next piece is kind of far away from the human. So the robot could come in and help the human by bringing that piece closer to them. That's kind of cool. You know, if you're building Ikea furniture or something and having a robot that could hand you the next screw, that could be useful. More interesting to me is you could also think about the robot helping the human to achieve a plan that's better. Better than, what, better, than what human, better than what the human might have done on their own. So in this case, the human's going to start working. And now the robot is going to purposefully sabotage the human's plan. It's going to realize, oh, if the human picks up this piece that's really close to it, that's going to be a that's going to result in a bad circuit. So I'm going to take that piece out of the way so that the human is forced to do the right thing. So this is kind of a cool example of the robot really helping the human, not by giving the human what it wants but by making it harder for the human to do the wrong thing. Now, of course, the human could always say, dude, robot, give that back. So ultimately the human has control, but it would be that extra effort in order to get the piece that the robot is sure the human doesn't need. The last example I'll give of human ag agent teaming is talking about a compatibility update. So let's, let's say you're in a medical setting, um, you're learning to, you, you have an agent that's di diagnosing cancer and the agent and the human or a human doctor are working together to look at, um, cis, look at a scan and figure out, is there cancer here? And the human has the ultimate decision, but the agent could, could suggest, yes, this is cancer. No, this is not cancer. Now, you could have an agent that's pretty good. It's, you know, 80% accurate. But it turns out it's, it's really bad at diagnosing men over 50. So the human could learn, okay, when the agent is telling me something about men over 50, I probably don't want to trust the agent. Fine. Now, let's say someone updates the agent. And the agent goes from 80% accurate to 90% accurate. The agent improves. but instead of getting men over 50 incorrect, now 
with this update, the agent's gotten better overall, but now it's not very good at women 35 to 40. So now the human doesn't know what the agent is good or bad at. So the performance of the whole team could go down even though the agent has improved. So this was other work that was done by Microsoft. And they did this in a, a crowdsourced domain where they're having people make decisions where people were uh, had an AI that could help them and they could either listen to that AI or not. The details aren't as important as looking at doing a compatible versus incompatible update. So the agent gets better. If the agent gets better and is still wrong sometimes, but wrong in the same way. So for instance, still being wrong at classifying men over 50, then that just makes the human agent team better. If there's an incompatible update, if the agent is better, but now changes its behavior, the performance of the team goes down. And that's where the um, orange line is. And it, there's a hit to the team performance, but then over time, the team catches up. So this is really interesting in the reinforcement learning perspective, because if you have a, a reinforcement learning agent working with a human, that human is learning over time, but that agent is also learning over time. So thinking about how can we make sure that the team is learning together and the human understands what the agent will do, where the agent's strengths and weaknesses are, but also hopefully the agent adapts to the human and figures out where it can be most useful. So there are, I do not know of many human agent teaming applications that are currently deployed. I know the, the vehicle dispatching was a proof of concept. I don't think it's actually in production, but I predict that there will be more and more reinforcement learning deployed, certainly, but also in the near future that we'll, we will have more agent human teams deployed where we think about a human could do this job, but an agent can help the human agent team do it faster or more efficiently. So with that, I'm gonna wrap up. Um, just think about three open challenges. So for, for, for those of you who are thinking this was too easy, oh, Matt's got it all figured out. Oh no, we, we do not have it all figured out. So the first, first question I'll bring out is trying to figure out what type of modality. So I mentioned a human could give a demonstration, a human might give action advice. We've also done experiments and we're actually working on a project now where humans could provide some code. So bring in an undergraduate student, have them write a five line program and use that program to help your agent learn faster. Or you could have a human give feedback so saying, thinking about the human giving a reward say, so that the human could say good agent, bad agent. You could think about curriculum design. You could, a human could say, agent, learn on this easier task Thanks. first and then learn on the hard task. And but that hu those human provided curricula can help the agent learn faster. Right now, we don't have a great understanding of which of these types of help work better in what situations. And it probably depends on a bunch of things. For instance, if a person is really good at playing Pac-Man, they could probably give good demonstrations. If they're not good at playing Pac-Man, they could still point out where the agent messed up. And finally, I'll mention that we could, we're, we're also looking at how we could teach people to become better agent teachers. Because think about, we, we're, we're going to get more agents, more physically embodied agents, robots in the, in the world. Some of our workforce is going to go into becoming agent or uh, robot teachers or agent and robot maintainers. So thinking about how we can have people best support our agents and teach them or help them learn or just help them function. Specifically, uh, we've been, my lab has been doing a lot of work on this advice and thinking about how do we best use this advice or who triggers it. I mentioned what I talked about was the teacher making all the decisions, but you could also have the student saying, asking for help because the student might know what it doesn't know. Or what if you have multiple teachers? What if you have a human who can give you great advice, but is kind of expensive 
and you have another agent that's better than you, but it's not as good as the human, but it's cheaper. So how do you decide who to ask for advice? And maybe instead of just getting that advice and following it, maybe you could get that advice and store it and somehow use it. So we've been looking at that. The final bit of open work I'll mention is there's a lot of exciting work on explainability and trying to help humans better understand agents. So if, if I want my autonomous car to drive me, I probably want to understand how that car is going to act. I want to trust it. And if the human doesn't trust the agent, you might not use it, you might not deploy it. But also in a human agent team, if the human doesn't understand why the agent is making the decisions it does, that team is not going to perform as well. So there's a lot of interesting research on explainability and saying, well, I don't want an agent that's just a black box, that's a deep neural network. Instead, I want to figure out what the agent's doing and, and be able to anticipate what decisions it would make. So for students, there are a lots of exciting open questions in this area. If you're looking for something to keep you busy for, for a number of years, I can recommend thinking about humans and, and reinforcement learning agents. So really, reinforcement learning is this very popular class, uh, type of uh, machine learning right now. It's becoming more and more popular. And my main take-home message from this talk was a reinforcement learning agent could learn from nothing, could learn from scratch. But if there's existing knowledge from other agents, from a program, from a human, there's lots of ways you can use it and really improve the agent's performance very quickly. And be on the lookout for places where humans and agents can work together for even better performance. So I do think this is an exciting time for reinforcement learning, particularly thinking about reinforcement learning in humans. So if you are interested in learning more about reinforcement learning, there's two things I'll point you to. The first one is there's a Coursera class at UL, by U Alberta. A couple of my colleagues, Martha and Adam White, made a really nice Coursera class it's, it's uh, I would say it's an advanced undergraduate class that you, you can do it in a few months. I will also point out um, a friend of mine has a startup called Deep Eigen. It's an India-based startup. And Deep Eigen has a reinforcement learning class that's going to be online. And this Deep Eigen class is targeted at graduate students who want a more in-depth treatment of reinforcement learning. So... If you are interested in reinforcement learning, these are a couple of resources, but it's a great time to get into this field because there's so many ways of learning online. Many of them are free. And I just hope, I hope that I've conveyed how reinforcement learning can and hopefully will change the world. Um, so with that, I think I will end and thank you for all your attention. Thank you so much, sir. That was indeed a very informative presentation. Now moving towards the Q&A session, I would first like to request the general chair, uh, Dr. Swarup Malik sir, to ask his question, if any. Hello, Matt. Uh, thank you very much. Excellent talk. I think the motivation is great. Uh, I'm sure not only the students, but everybody here would like to actually go to the Coursera class and follow up your references <laughs> after this excellent, beautiful talk. And uh, yes, it was also a little, uh, oh, what I would say, um, uh, disconcerting because I was uh, trying to write down some questions and uh, the, the next sentence or the next slide would give, would give the answers as if you, you were picking the brain of the students or the, the audience that anticipating all the questions. Uh, so, uh, so at last I am, Towards the end, I am left with a couple of questions, uh, which is one was RL explainability, and I was uh, and you covered that <laughs> uh, how the explanation of the agents could uh, help uh, the humans understand the motivation behind the um, why the agents chose certain actions, uh, and that might. Uh, uh, lead to some kind of good reconciliation of the knowledge between the agents and the, and the humans. But uh, uh, my question was uh, uh, just like uh, we 
can quantify and measure the performance or the convergence of the agents. What kind of things one can do for uh, measuring the humans um, knowledge <laughs> convergence? <laughs> and then the second question uh, is uh, uh, the human teacher is good, but uh, have you seen students in this case, the agents getting kind of biased into one kind of thinking so that they will not try. For example, and the, when the, I think the alpha, uh, alpha, the chase version of AlphaGo, the first one, uh, when they came out with uh, humans knowledge built into uh, the positions, which positions are good and all that. So that had a certain score, but when they introduced Alpha Zero, which learned from the scratch, that uh, was much better. Of course, a lot of games were played, but uh, it could actually think very differently from the humans. So uh, that's the question I wanted to ask, the possibly by a possible bias by the teachers. Yeah, thank you for those. Um, so I'll, I'll point out that we could absolutely have humans with different abilities and trying to figure out what their abilities are could help us figure out where to get their help. So for instance, um, if, if I had, if I was doing stock trading, if I had one human that was really good at figuring out short selling in tech stocks, and I had a different human that was really good at figuring out when to buy energy stocks. If I knew those different human strengths, then I could figure out who to ask in different situations. Now, of course, humans are very uh, uh, messy and they can change over time, they can learn, they can have bad days. So all of this, the agent has to somehow account for. And we don't, we absolutely do not have all the answers there. But then there's your question about biasing the agent and that absolutely comes in. So if we think um, in reinforcement learning, in some cases, if you give the agent enough experience, it will converge to the optimal policy. That's possible in simple games. If we're talking about Go or chess or StarCraft, now, unfortunately, many, or I would say most of those guarantees go out the window and our agent is not going to converge to the optimal policy for Go. Instead, it's likely to converge to some locally optimal policy. Now, if you have a human that's giving bias, you might end up in one local optimum. And if you have an agent that learns completely from scratch, you may end up with a different local optimum that's even better. And right now, we don't have a great way to know of the best way to bias the agent to get towards the better local optimum. So instead, I try to argue that Look, we, we care most about that perf getting to a reasonable performance quickly. And you're right, if we could, we could also have a separate agent that was just training from scratch. And you know, if that agent that was training from scratch eventually could outperform my biased agent, great. And we could swap over at that point. But another, another interesting thing you mentioned is if I have that agent that is trained from scratch, it might come up with completely unexpected strategies. And I know there was some commentary about the Go player, that the, the, the agent playing Go just wasn't like a human. And that's really where the explainability can come in because we want our agents to be able to say, I am taking this move because, or the agent to say, I am not doing this other thing because this bad thing would happen, that kind of counterfactual reason. But trying to get the agents to make themselves human understandable, because if, if we can't understand our agents, it can be a lot harder to trust them. And maybe you trust them for Pac-Man, but maybe not for your autonomous car. And so if our agents aren't able to explain themselves and humans uh, may not be willing to trust them. So it's an it's a important open topic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Now we open the gate for all the questions and queries of the audience. In order to ask questions, please raise your hand up using the raise hand feature in the reactions down below. Does anybody have any questions, please? Okay, so uh, I would like to take an 
Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, Raj, I can ask another question. Yeah, or sure. Maybe a comment uh, about the very nice uh, observation about the U uh, in hat. I think that was, uh, yeah, when you were, yeah, right. Uh, so uh, I did not get the argument, uh, the intuition behind this ad, but I was thinking that uh, initially, uh, if we are giving all the advices and uh, uh, the student is kind of ramping up fast, so that can happen. But after that, is it is the drop that is because of the exploration on its own by the student? Yes, that, that is my intuition as well. Because we were thinking about the one way you could interpret this is the agent is trying to learn to be like the teacher and it does fairly well, but then it tries to explore and see if it can try out other things that it never saw while being biased by the teacher. And then over time, it returns back to some performance. So it's either over, when, once it returns at the end of the U, it's either coming back to how the teacher was playing or it's found an equally good strategy. We don't have a really good way of understanding um, why it does this, but I think, I think it is an interesting point for future research to try to figure out if we can avoid this unlearning or figure out more about if, if this is a different local optima, how did we get there and how did the human bias it towards that particular one? Okay. Thank you so much. Yes, Do we I have time see, for another? I can see, yeah, I can see Mr. Bapi Aju sir uh, is having a question. Kindly proceed, sir. Yeah, uh, th thank you, Professor Taylor, for a uh, very uh, informative and uh, uh, a talk that uh, really uh, encourages students to go into RL is a uh, field of my interest and fascination also. Uh, one question that I had, uh, general question, I guess this is not covered in this particular uh, talk, but in terms of uh, state uh, representation <clears throat> within the RL system, uh, uh, it uh, appears that most of the RL algorithms uh, work on uh, discrete uh, state uh, representation. And this, uh, uh, of course, there, I'm aware some work on actually learning the uh, representation of the world in terms of, uh, you know, how to discretize. But is that still a problem in terms of, uh, you know, I, I can have, uh, you know, I don't have the world come in in a really predetermined, uh, you know, state space that, that, right? And I still have to learn and uh, I may need uh, some way to carve up the world in terms of, uh, states, uh, some are uh, large states that last for longer time. Some states are, uh, you know, smaller. And <clears throat> is that an important problem? What is your, uh, what are your views on this? Well, you, you've hit a critical problem right on the nose. So in, in this very simple example, you could learn with a two, two discrete numbers, and, but we had to use human knowledge to get there. There's a, there's a ton of exciting open research on discovering good state representations. Because we could learn from pixels, and that, but that would be extremely slow. So how can an agent learn what's important? So one, one of the thing, one of the ways you could approach it is let's try to just let a human come up with a bunch of different uh, possibilities and then let the agent figure out what's important. I think where, where the field is going more right now is letting the agent propose its own features and trying to learn what's important. And one of the um, difficulties is a lot of stuff, a lot of the state could be irrelevant. So in this case, in Flappy Bird, the background changes between night and day. That has absolutely no effect on the game, but the agent might not know that. And getting agents to understand what to ignore is, is an exciting open topic. 
that um, is absolutely critical because if the agent doesn't have sufficient information to represent the state, if the agent doesn't un understand it well enough, it won't act very well. But the more information you throw at the agent, the larger your state space is, the more difficult it is for that agent to learn. And that's where you get into the you know, hundreds of years of compute trying to automatically learn the good representations through deep convolutional neural networks. So thank you for that. Uh, are there any more questions from the audience? Okay, so now I would like to take an opportunity.